uh, the, with the farm bill, uh, with the farm bill moving, it's uh, a monumental opportunity and moment to talk about the intersections that we see between the, the farm bill and the U.S. market for biochar and the global market, as I mentioned. Uh, so to just contextualize and, and give us some some opening context, I'll turn it over to Wendy Liu, who's going to provide welcoming remarks. Wendy is the executive director of the International Biochar Initiative. Thank you, Ben, and to the Carbon Business Council and the U.S. Biochar Initiative for co-hosting this webinar, looking at the importance of the U.S. Farm Bill for the global biochar industry. I want to thank also the 300 attendees from 41 countries who are joining us for this webinar. As Ben said, I'm Wendy Lou McGill, the Executive Director for the International Biochar Initiative, or IBI. IBI is a global membership-based organization. Our mission is to help the biochar industry grow by providing education, knowledge, and advocacy for biochar as a proven carbon removal solution with powerful co-benefits. IBI has over 600 members based in 63 countries, and I invite you to learn more about our work and join us at biochar-international.org. So before we get to this really exciting panel, I'd like to try to set the stage about why the US Farm Bill is highly relevant for the global biochar industry. The US Farm Bill is estimated to be roughly half a trillion dollars in funding over a five-year period. This makes it the largest single funding legislation for the US agricultural sector, affecting how the second largest agricultural economy in the world is managed. Even viewed conservatively, I believe we can say that the US agricultural policy historically has contributed to climate change and to all of the negative associated effects on farming, farming communities, and really the global community. A farm bill that supports biochar among other climate solution practices and technologies can change that. The name farm bill doesn't really convey its broad mandate. The farm bill not only directly supports US farmers and the companies that provide them services and products, it also funds food access for U.S. families and communities, and really relevant for today's discussion, it's the nation's largest source of national government funding for private lands conservation. The Farm Bill is integral to rural energy and development, forest re restoration and conservation, as well as agricultural research. Creating support in the 2023 Farm Bill for Biochar is a critical opportunity to strengthen these programs to better support healthy people, healthy planet, and a healthy farm economy, while also supporting carbon removal that is essential to staying on a 1.5 to 2 degree pathway. And given how policies and practices in large agricultural economies like the US can affect other economies, what happens in the U.S. agricultural economy is globally relevant. Lastly, remember that the Farm Bill is coming on the heels of recent and historic U.S. funding for climate solutions, including the Climate Smart Commodities Pilot, the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as more targeted programs like Code 336 from the USDA and CRS, which directly supports farmers to use biochar in their fields. So now let's turn to our panel to dig into the very fertile field of biochar and the U.S. Farm Bill. Thank you so much, Wendy, for those opening remarks and for letting uh, attendees have more context about the Farm Bill and, and the significance of the moment and, and the opportunity. I'm pleased to introduce all of our panelists and then get into the discussion and, and hearing more from our experts about everything that's, that's at play related to the farm bill and biochar and, and the global carbon removal market. So to briefly introduce our panelists, uh, we're, we're very pleased to have Sebastian Manhart joining us, who's a senior policy advisor at Carbon Future. Carbon Future is the leading platform globally for high quality carbon removal and accounts for about a quarter of all durable carbon removal transactions in 2022. We're also joined by Lauren Brainart, who's the Partnerships and Policy Director at Mino Carbon, which is a startup company that's committed to removing carbon uh, through building large-scale biochar production facilities. We're pleased to be joined by Dr. David Laird, who is uh, founder and president of NSITS Inc., an agro-technology company. And uh, Dr. Laird is also a professor emeritus at Iowa State University. We're also joined by Amy McRae-Kessler, who's the co-founder of the U.S. Biochar Initiative. 
And again, I'm the moderator for today's discussion, Ben Rubin, the Executive Director of the Carbon Business Council. So without further ado, excited to dig in here and, and get started. Just want to begin with covering what biochar is before we, we take a deeper dive into policy for any folks who are calling in today and not familiar. Uh, David, let's start with you. If you can give us an overview of biochar carbon removal and uh, the various pathways to what this is. Um, well, thank you, Ben. Uh, yeah, I'm David Laird, um, Professor Emeritus, Iowa State University and president of this little ag tech startup company called Ensense. Biochar is uh, produced from biomass through some kind of thermal chemical conversion uh, in the absence of oxygen. It's charcoal, basically. Uh, what distinguishes it from charcoal is its use in as a soil amendment or other environmental applications. It is effective for carbon sequestration for two reasons. One, because a large percentage of the carbon in biochar is formed of what we call condensed aromatic carbon, which means it's a form of carbon that is highly recalcitrant to microbial degradation. So when you put it in the soil, it stays there for a long period of time. Not all of it, but the majority of the carbon that's in the char itself can have a half-life in hundreds or even thousands of years. Secondly, Biochar enhances soil quality in various ways, soil health. And this can have cascading impacts on biomass production, crop growth, uh, water quality, and of course, on carbon sequestration. A phenomenon known as negative priming can also be an additive effect. And what that means, is you put the char in the ground, but then you're also adding like roots and crop residue, leaves and so on to the soil. And the char makes it more efficient at stabilizing that new biological carbon that comes in every year. Every year. And as a result, you can actually start a positive feedback that builds soil quality. Uh, so from these perspectives, biochar has a lot of opportunities. The challenge, of course, is in monetizing it, turning it into a business, and scaling it up to a gigaton or more to actually have an impact on climate change. And uh, there's a number of opportunities now. Lots of, of little companies have started in various ways and forms, uh, and but many of them are dependent on pretty high prices of carbon. So one of the challenges to scaling it up is getting that price down. Uh, a lot of companies are working with slow pyrolysis technology or gasification technology. But there's a third alternative, which is called uh, fast pyrolysis. Each of these have advantages and disadvantages. Slow pyrolysis is more effective at producing carbon or has a greater carbon, biochar carbon yield, um, but generally has little opportunity for capturing the bioenergy co-product that can come along with a slow pyrolysis system. Uh, and generally is more applicable at a smaller scale. Gasification is a technology which produces heat, steam, power as a co-product of uh, along with biochar and can be coupled with an industry uh, that needs to use that heat steam power or could be used to generate electricity which is fed back into the grid. Um, electricity, heat steam power are relatively low value. Fast pyrolysis, uh, in particular a, a version of fast pyrolysis known as autothermal fast pyrolysis, uh, is still not at a commercial scale. It is at a um, demonstration scale. There's a 50 ton a day uh, autothermal plant uh, in Redfield, Iowa uh, that is up and running. So we would say it's probably at technology readiness level seven, i.e. one step away from being commercial. Uh, it has the advantage of producing as co-products with biochar a bio crude, 
which can be used directly as a bunker fuel, a liquid bunker fuel in uh, for heating or for uh, marine transportation, as well as uh, being shipped to a refinery and turned into diesel and other types of fuels that directly offset petroleum. And secondly, it produces a pyrolytic sugar product, which can be uh, upgraded, fermented to ethanol, and there's a new pathway to turn ethanol into jet fuel. So you're generating these high value products. So those are the main pathways for generating biochar and or generating bioenergy co-products. Thanks so much, Dr. There. It's really helpful to have that overview. And I think good context as we're having the discussion today to be reminded that when we're talking about biochar carbon removal, how it becomes this umbrella term for the multiple different pathways that exist for biochar. And just to stay on this for a moment, Lauren, it'd be great to go to you and just get a spotlight on Minocarbon's approach. I, I, I think it 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 nest within what Dr. Laird was talking about, but I, I just think for attendees to we get a sense of what it looks like on the ground of a company who's um, working on biochar. If you a little bit more about Minos approach, it would be great. Of course, thank you. And thanks, David, for that great overview. So I, I'm with Mino Carbon, and we are a startup um, based in Washington State in the, in the US. And our mission is to remove carbon at scale. And we do this by building large scale carbon removal facilities, which are essentially large scale biochar production facilities. We intake waste biomass pre predominantly from in-woods residuals, the large slash piles that you see in, in our state. We take in those residuals and produce about 40,000 tons of biochar and in the process generate renewable baseload electricity. Once online, our facility will be the largest biochar production facility in North America. Um, and we will be building our first facility in Northeast Washington in Kettle Falls, which is a rural timber dependent community um, in our state. Our goal is to build multiple large scale biochar production facilities across the US. Um, and really our goal is to support large scale carbon removal, regenerative agriculture, and prevailing wage job creation in, in, our rural, um, in our rural economies. Look forward to diving into how the Farm Bill can help support and catalyze um, our, our company and the biochar industry at scale. Excellent, thank you so much, Lauren. Really helpful to have that, that spotlight and an example. Amy, it'd be great to go over to you to see if there's anything else you wanna to add to the definition of what we're talking about when we're talking about biochar carbon removal. And, and while we're on you, if, if you could expand both on that, but then tell us a little bit more about the state of play in the U.S. biochar market today, um, where we are, how things are looking in the U.S. market, uh, which sure. would be excellent. Thank you. So my name is Amy McRae Kessler, um, and I am co-founder of the U.S. Biochar Coalition, which is a, a group that we are getting together um, of different industry stakeholders for the purpose of um, advocacy in the Farm Bill and then going forward in order to grow biochar um, access to markets. So I just wanted to uh, tell a little bit more about US Biochar Coalition. Um, and uh, I did wanna just touch on electricity for a moment and um, reframe the way that, that uh, the industry thinks about value of, of products. Um, so as we are looking at transitioning to um, uh, zero emission vehicles um, and uh, a zero emissions uh, future um, for energy, electricity is becoming increasingly valuable. Um, it is also especially zero emissions or carbon negative electricity, which is something that can be produced in addition to biochar um, from that same process. Um, and that is becoming um, a, a high value energy asset um, to produce. The other factor in the US that is driving value around that is grid instability. We have a lot of um, uh, rural areas as well as very developed areas like California um, that are experiencing significant grid instability due to um, aging infrastructure, extreme weather, um, we almost had a major, um, you know, MISO middle of the country collapse during, I don't know if folks remember the December uh, cold snap. And uh, biochar facilities that produce electricity on a baseload basis and can typically do it for a little bit less than um, other energy producers um, with a higher fossil footprint 
uh, because biochar is producing additional products, um, that is a very attractive market to start thinking about getting into. Um, also, folks should be thinking about reductions in um, scope two emissions that are coming up for um, a lot of companies that are going to be uh, needing to report for ESG purposes to maintain investment and keep access to markets open. Um, and then at the uh, American Biogas Council, we've also been able to advocate for um, an ERIN pathway that allows for biomass to electricity to qualify under the RFS. So that's additional finance that you can get on those um, on your electricity pathways. So I would just um, like to reframe and have folks think about the value of electricity a little bit more. You, you can also make um, carbon negative hydrogen and all of these other zero emissions transition fuels. Um, and those are wonderful to think about also. Um, so uh, coming back to um, the US biochar industry, you wanted me to give an overview of, of that. Um, so basically um, the, the industry um, as I see it today is um, has been um, uh, kind of fragmented and um, predominantly um, occupied by smaller producers. About 74% of producers produce 50 tons per less, 50 tons per year or less. Um, and that, um, that is you know, a, a little too small to be moving the dial on um, uh, getting biochar into markets to do all of the great things that it does for agriculture, uh, landscape restoration, ecosystem services, water filtration. Um, and it is certainly a little too small to be moving the dial on carbon removal. Um, so needing to grow the industry is um, for the planet, for people, for um, uh, prosperity is a, is a significant issue and one that U.S. Uh, Biochar Coalition is set up to try to solve. Um, we also have a, a situation in which only 8% of um, biochar producers are making electricity. And um, I think, you know, that is um, one of the things that has held the industry back in the U.S. from scaling uh, is business models that are not optimizing all of the potential outputs of a biochar system. Um, you can produce energy, um, biochar, um, and thankfully, thank you to folks like Microsoft and Carbon Future who are growing our carbon removal markets. There are now additional ways to monetize that biochar. Um, but one of the other things that we need to open are the sequestration markets. Um, and so um, the other thing that I do see is um, a need for more uh, sophisticated technologies to enter. Um, paralysis and gasification have typically been held back from scaling due to technology issues. So um, things like tarring, um, cracking, logging, going down, or being extremely energy intensive. Um, there are technologies that are able to be self-sufficient um, in their energy footprint, which is fantastic for locating in rural communities where the feedstock is. Um, and then um, there are technologies that are operating at higher temperatures, which um, is incredibly important for energy generation, but also for um, achieving that very high value carbon removal, which I think um, Sebastian will probably tell us more about. But in order to achieve the highest quality carbon removal, you want to be operating um, at uh, close to um, you know, 850 to 900 C, and that is not the typical profile in the U.S. Um, that gives you a more permanent sequestration with your O uh, to um, H ratio, O to C ratios and H to C ratios, which is what people look at. Um, and so I think we need to see sort of a whole evolution in the United States with um, newer or more advanced technologies coming in um, markets opening that are not just agriculture-based. Um, biochar serves a lot of different markets, um, a lot of them nature-based, and the nature-based markets are becoming one of the, um, uh, I would say, hottest and fastest growing investment trends of our, of our time. Um, and biochar underpins all of that with soil health. Um, it goes into biodiversity, landscape restoration, regenerative agriculture, and soil health which are all critical to um, the global economy 
um, continuing to function. So um, a massive opportunity to grow there, but we're a little siloed from those markets. So that's what we're working on. Thank you, Amy. Uh, appreciate that. And Amy, I also appreciate that you were starting to touch on the, the global market and what's how some of what's happening in the U.S. is different than what's happening in Europe. And Sebastian, it would be great to go over to you to tell us a little bit more about the state of the biochar market in Europe today. And in the process of answering that, if there's anything else you want to touch on of additional observations or comments on what's been said so far, please feel free to jump in with that too. But it would just be great for, for folks to hear more about what we're looking at when we're thinking about biochar carbon removal in Europe. Yeah, happy to. And I should say at this point that beyond my role at Carbon Future, I'm also the lead of the policy working group at the European Biochar Industry Consortium. So I have um, quite a lot of insights into what's happening in Europe, and I'm happy to share them now. Maybe before diving into Europe, um, a reminder for everyone that according to CDI-FOI, which is CDR.FYI, which is a very good aggregator of industrial carbon removal statistics, um, Last year, uh, biochar carbon removal accounted for 87% of all deliveries. So it's you know a huge, huge fraction of this and 40% of purchases. Um, so it is the most dominant carbon removal method that we have available today. And um, within Europe, and this is largely builds on the market report that the EBI, the European Biochar Industry Consortium releases once a year, um, which I, by the way, heavily recommend uh, looking at if you're interested diving much deeper than what I'm about to say. In Europe, um, last year, we had uh, 33,500 tons of biochar produced, which is set to grow this year to around 50,000 tons. And that's the equivalent of 150,000 tons of CO2 removed, right? And I think it's good to bear that number in mind, because if you think about um where we are currently at with industrial removals, that's actually quite a lot. I know it's still a drop in the ocean, but it's it's a significant amount compared to other pathways. And what's exciting as well is we're looking at compound annual growth rates of almost 70%. So in Europe alone, um, we're predicting that we're going to remove around 10 million tons uh, of CO2 by 2030 and around 100 million tons by 2040. And at that level, at 100 million tons, you're starting to be climate relevant. So these are exciting growth rates. Um, most of this is driven, which is, I think, quite in contrast to what uh, Amy just said, most of this is driven by large and very large plants um, in Europe. And we actually see that, you know, four of these plants have a technology readiness level already of nine, a lot of the others eight. So we're talking about very sophisticated um, equipment that is being developed and deployed in Europe. Um, and yeah, that's definitely something that I would say Europe is shining at and that we can hopefully uh, leverage across the world. Uh, interesting, maybe final point is that almost 50% of this entire BCR that's happening in Europe is in the German speaking countries, Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, um, around 25% in the Nordics, and then all others combined account for the, for the remaining quarter. So it's fairly concentrated in a few regions, um, which are not necessarily the regions where we have most uh, biomass availability. Eastern Europe in particular is incredib incredibly high potential, but currently not really on the uh, BCR uh, train. So yeah, I hope this gives kind of a good overview of where we're at in Europe. And yeah, it's very promising, as I said, where it currently stands. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And I, I think that is is good context based on the snapshot that we've had of the European market and Amy's helpful summary of, of what we're looking at in the US market and how David and Lauren have been able to summarize what we're talking about when we're talking about biochar. Want to start uh, transitioning into the topic at hand today on, on policy and the farm bill in particular. Uh, Wendy provided a helpful overview of the farm bill at, at the beginning for folks who were on and heard that. Um, but Amy, want to turn to you if you can give us an, an overview of the farm bill, adding to anything that Wendy mentioned for folks who aren't familiar with it, what it is, what the opportunity is before we, we start diving even deeper into the, the biochar opportunities and, and where it's moving right now. Sure. So um, in addition to uh, the U.S. Biochar Coalition, um, I am, I've been involved in um, bioenergy um, uh, for a, a, a long time. Um, and one of the things that I had the pleasure of doing was get uh, be become a founding board member of the American Biogas Council. And I started their federal policy program in 2011 um, when we were 20 companies. And not on anyone's radar at all, um, and worked, uh, wrote program plans, worked hard to build that, that advocacy program because building awareness at the federal level um, is essential to industry growth. 
Um, we had no incentives. Um, we were not being paid attention to by any of the agencies um, and uh, just being left out as a, a form of renewable energy. And then um, all of the wonderful things that, that biogas systems can address from an environmental perspective. And over the course of 12 years, we were able to um, grow the industry um, to having hundreds of millions of dollars in, in incentives, and it is now a $68 billion economic value. Um, and that shows you the power of, of having a organized effort um, to, to be involved in policy. Farm Bill is a big part of how we were able to do that. Um, and as Wendy said, Farm Bill is not just about um, farm. It is about um, so much more than that. And for biochar, I see it as, um, as having a lot of, of opportunity. Farm Bill is something that um, every five years uh, happens and it is, um, uh, it's must pass legislation. So um, this, this is gonna happen. Um, it is something that anybody who has exposure to agricultural or soil or nutrition or forestry um, or bio-based manufacturing um, uh, markets needs to have a, uh, a voice in and, and a seat at the table. Um, and so that's basically why we started the U.S. Biochar Coalition, so that we could get involved in Farm Bill and, um, and start to make some inroads in using the provisions of Farm Bill to build markets. Um, and so looking at Farm Bill, uh, we uh, took a look at how, how can we come in um, and, and kind of come in from the side. A lot of people think about biochar from its uh, first and arguably highest value, um, which is as a negative emissions technology. Um, but in order to grow that, particularly in the US where climate removal is not a, a narrative that necessarily resonates with politicians or rural communities. Um, looking at what I call the secondary, the sequ sequestration markets or secondary sequestration markets um, and opening those is the way that I think we break open this market. And I, I see uh, the current situation as being um, biochar producers and research is, 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 has been sort of in a silo over here. And then there are all these growing application markets that are in a silo over here and groups working hard there. The, both biochar and these groups benefit uh, one another significantly and together they grow exponentially. And so I see Farm Bill as being a mechanism to have USDA, uh, Forest Service, and, um, and others start to begin the process of integrating um, through practices. And it's also an, an excellent opportunity to create awareness and education at the federal um, legislative and policy level. Um, so Farm Bill is about agriculture for sure, <laughs> um, uh, but it's also about uh, forestry um, and it is about research. It's about rural development. It's about nutrition, conservation. Um, it's about economic development for rural areas. Um, it is about uh, livestock and it's about um, agricultural defense and security. Um, so when we looked at the, uh, the farm bill, we went in and said, what does an industry need to grow? Um, well, in the United States, if you do not have um, an economic uh, body following you um, to do analysis of how you impact um, economy, um, you are not gonna be able to get uh, legislative attention. The way industries typically do that is through getting a NAICS code. Um, you have to be of a significant size to get a NAICS code. So. Farm Bill actually offers an excellent opportunity to start building that economic track record and policy analysis track record through their economic policy and analysis groups. Um, so one of the things the coalition has done is request um, that they form a special group to start following um, biochar as it relates to um, you know, savings on climate, savings on um, climate disasters, um, uh, different different ways um, that uh, we can uh, put economic value around the benefits and also avoided costs of biochar. 
We also took a look at um, uh, a role in disaster programs. <laughs> so that you might not think um, disaster is a place you wanna go, but um, when we look at the disasters covered under the farm bill, they are usually around crop failure and um, uh, flooding, things like that. Um, and it, one of the goals of, of the administration is always going to be to save money and always going to be to help um, secure and stabilize farmers and rural economies. And biochar has a significant role to play in that um, with replenishing soil health um, and making it more resistant to drought um, and also uh, more resilient during floods. Um, so we've worked in some provisions to have biochar be part of these programs um, to qualify for crop insurance um, and uh, to help mitigate those risks. Um, conservation. Thank you. Is, oh, sorry. Thank, thank you, Amy. No, I appreciate you going through the long list and, and it's great to hear about the different areas. And I think also just for attendees who are either familiar with each of the different provisions you're talking through or for folks who aren't, just to be aware of, of I think one of the points you're making of how many provisions are in the farm bill that are relevant mm -hmm. for biochar and climate change that and, and how versatile it is. Um, just wanna, um, based on all the helpful points you're making, jump over to Lauren to expand a little bit too on, on things that, that you've been taking a look at in, in the farm bill, Lauren. Both you and, and Sebastian have been working on a, a policy brief for the Carbon Business Council that specifically dives into carbon removal opportunities in the farm bill. And so if you just can can share a little bit more about what that is, what's coming up with it, some of the, the key recs in there, that would be great. And then we'll, we'll go over to Sebastian next uh, to expand as well. Cool. Thanks. And, and Amy, thank you for that really helpful overview. Mino has been participating both with the U.S. Um, Biochar Coalition and the Carbon Business Council to develop our ass. Obviously, the farm bill is huge. And so refining our ass and, and figuring out what would have the greatest impact to accelerate the biochar industry is 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 what we're what we're working on. Um, you know, for our company, um, we believe that the, the farm bill could dramatically expand biochar adoption and support the expansion of climate smart agriculture and as well as and expand the availability of sustainable feedstock for biochar production. First, on the feedstock front, right now, I think many of you know um, the, the U.S. burns or just lets decays hundreds of millions of tons of crop residue and um, in-woods residuals that, you know, get burned or decays on in, out in the woods, just emitting that CO2 right back into the atmosphere. The Farm Bill has a significant opportunity to incentivize the removal and utilization of those residues for biochar production. Particularly, we are advocating for expanded funding for the USDA Biomass Crop Assistance Program, expansion of the US Forest Service Wood Innovation Grant and other similar incentives so we can pull those residuals out of the woods and out of, um, out of our fields to utilize it for a climate and economic benefit. So that's one key area of the farm bill that we are looking into. Another area is around incentivizing broad biochar adoption as a climate smart um, uh, agricultural amendment, feed additive, and, and supporting other industries, particularly around agriculture. The U.S. Farm Bill, which I think Amy was about to go into, um, you know, invests millions and millions of dollars into conservation programs, particularly NRCS, um, Environmental Equality Incentives Program, EQIP program, as it's called, is a program where um, producers get um, actually paid to support climate smart practices, including biochar application. We are requesting for that program to be continued to be funded, expanded, and really incentivizing climate smart practices such as biochar application. Um, along those lines, the need for diverse um, or research around biochar's impact on diverse cropping systems, supporting the Biochar Research Network Act and similar provisions um, will support biochar as an agricultural amendment um, uh, and, and open up that, that market. Um, a couple other opportunities to name to really expand biochar markets is expanding facility funding. Um, the Farm Bill, as Amy mentioned, supports economic development and particularly rural economic development. 
Our company recently applied for a fertilizer production expansion grant, which might not scream biochar facility funding, but has the opportunity to provide about $40 million in funding for our first facility. Programs like this are huge to jumpstart the, the industry in the US. And then lastly to name, other, other funding for research, development, and deployment around biochar in diverse markets, particularly seeing funding around um, biochar enhanced fertilizer and other bioproduct um, research and development will be really beneficial as the industry moves. Um, so those are just to name a few, um, and I'll hand it over to Sebastian to expand. I have nothing to add. I think that was very comprehensive. Maybe I'll just give a shout out that um, the Carbon Business Council will be releasing uh, this brief on the Farm Bill on the 2nd of May. Um, so yeah, watch out for news coming your way then. But other than that, nothing else to add. Great. Thank you, Sebastian. I appreciate you making the plug for the date of the release. And yeah, I, I think it's really helpful to hear from Amy and Lauren, just how many opportunities there are within the Farm Bill, how comprehensive it is, and there's even more that like, the, the list goes on and on. And so I think for folks to be able to follow up and hear, like we're, we're scratching the, the tip of the iceberg with how many possibilities there are. Um, I think to just recognizing that we have not covered all of the opportunities, but I, I think are doing a helpful job of demonstrating how many opportunities there are. Uh, David, want to turn it over to you if you can just expand as we start to think about this plethora of different pathways and what the farm bill means for biochar carbon removal in the US. If you can just tell us why it matters um, and how it matters for the biochar market in America and globally. Okay, well, it, it matters because of dollars and cents. It matters because of business opportunities, business supporting uh, entrepreneurs, startup businesses. It matters because of opening markets and making uh, 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 biochar into, you know, more accepted. Uh, you know, I've been in this business for a long time and, and biochar early on was, was quite frankly, uh, not recognized and it was uh, uh, dismissed as, as being, you know, so much foo-foo dust and this sort of thing. Um, that's changed. And we are at the precipice where uh, biochar is being taken very seriously in the farming community. And getting that education part is also hugely important. Um, another piece that I want to touch on here is the research side. USDA supports both in-house research through the Agricultural Research Service and um, research at land-grant universities through, through NIFA. And that money is really critical towards developing both the fundamental science underlying biochar and the application in diverse soils, climates, cropping systems, diverse types of biochar. And um, so one area that uh, we've in particular been working on is what's known as the uh, Bio Biochar Research Network Act of 2023. And this is a bill that is bipartisan, uh, has been introduced in both the Senate and in the House as standalone bills at this time. Um, and in the Senate, we've got Grassley, Thume, Tester, and Brown all supporting it, two Republicans, two Democrats. Uh, in the House, we have five um, supporters, uh, uh, or five co-sponsors, uh, Marionette Miller-Meeks uh, and Dan Newhouse are the Republicans. And we've got uh, Pingree, uh, Shearer, uh, Panetta and um, Keston, all Democrats. So it's a very much a bipartisan bill. Uh, this is not going to pass on its own, but our goal is to get this incorporated into the farm bill. And what this legislation would do was would be to authorize the Secretary of Ag to establish up to 20 research sites, biochar research sites across the nation. And these would be looking at, again, 
uh, basic research, mechanistic processes, modeling, this sort of thing, and applied research, figuring out what works under what different conditions, as well as working on uh, pilot plants to produce biochar for ver various uh, applications. This piece of legislation calls for $50 million a year through 2028. Now, the way that laws work, if this were to be incorporated and passed with the Farm Bill, that would be fantastic, but there still would be no money to actually fund it. It would not be part of the mandatory component of the Farm Bill. Uh, which is, you know, which SNAP and which the conservation, uh, crop insurance, and um, uh, commodity support programs, those are all foundation or base support, and those are hard funded through the Farm Bill. This legislation, if it's put in there, would authorize it, but it wouldn't fund it, and it would require this additional supplemental annual appropriations for funding of this work. But this is an opportunity really to build a really in-depth uh, research network and databases around biochar. And I think this is really important for a number of reasons. But the first being, you know, the industry is getting going. We do not want spectacular failures out there. If we put the wrong type of biochar on the wrong soil under the wrong conditions, you know, we can have negative impacts. So we need to get it right up front and we need the basic and the applied research to get those situations resolved and figure out how to optimize its use. So that research component is really important. Uh, and uh, additional money going into NIFA for land grant universities, competitive grants uh, would be a really important piece of it. Great. Thank you so much, David. Amy, was there something that you wanted to jump in with on, on that as well as, as David was giving remarks? Yes, um, I just wanted to, as, as I was listening, um, uh, I was thinking about um, starting a dialogue in the community around in, integrating AI into, uh, into research. So I am familiar with um, a professor working at Yale who's developing an AI program um, around biochar. And basically, she is taking data that um, uh, it's biochar production under certain circumstances, residence time, temperature, feedstock, and then looking at the so soil profile where the biochar is, is going. And through an AI program, she is actually able to predict expected consequences um, in the soil. And, um, and so I think uh, integrating something like that um, would be incredibly beneficial to helping to, um, I think, um, compress some of the time um, around uh, the applied research. Um, it, the other, other thing that I think is happening in the industry is that there is a lot of research kind of sitting in silos. Um, and so finding a way to bring that together through something like this AI program um, might help speed adoption. Um, Absolutely, the uh, the applied research um, uh, needs to happen, um, but I think that a lot a lot has been done that's not being accessed, and so I just wanted to see what the other panelists think about using AI for that. Thanks so much, Amy, for for bringing that up, and and Lauren, we'll go to you to both respond to that, and and wanted to also ask as as we turn to you, um, I I think David did a, a fantastic job of highlighting some of the other federal legislation that's moving and how some of that can run parallel to the Farm Bill and how we might ultimately see some of it combined into the Farm Bill. And so Lauren, would be great to hear your thoughts on, on what Amy was posing about AI as that relates to biochar, but also just if there's other policies moving right now on biochar that you and the Mino team are taking a close look at that you wanna make sure that, that attendees are aware of. Yeah, thanks for the question. I honestly don't know much about AI and research, but what I do want to add there is, I think I would agree, we need, we, need, we need dollars towards applied biochar research for sure. 
but I don't think necessarily that 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 tail should wag the dog. I think the way we expand biochar at scale is is through um, is through the large you know large agricultural industry adoption of biochar and. I think the ways that we do that is through programs and incentives such as the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities, which invested over $1 billion into applied um, climate smart agricultural practices with some of the largest and growing agricultural players within the nation. Um, we did not see significant um, biochar projects funded through those programs, and I think um, that would be a pathway that the farm bill can invest in opportunities like that to support industry expansion. I'll note, right, we are in touch with fertilizer companies and large, large agricultural companies that know the research on biochar. At this point in time, you know, they need to do their own trials with the product, of course. But part of this is there is not significant enough pressure to make the transition needed um, in order to, to fully adopt um, biochar as a climate smart agricultural practice. So I think it needs to come at all sides. Um, and I think particularly an emphasis in, in the US that we're seeing around companies needing to um, really take a hard look at their scope to one through three emissions. We are seeing that as one of the largest um, door openings for the biochar industry, just to name, just to name one. Um, as I mentioned, biochar enhanced fertilizers, the ability for biochar not only to retain those fertil the fertilizer in the product to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, but also that reduces the potential for fertilizers, that reduces fertilizer company scope three emissions. Same for potting media, replacing perlite, vermiculite, and, um, and peat um, uh, within that potting media. So I think the scope three and the expansion of climate smart markets more broadly within agriculture is, is one of the biggest doors that needs to open more widely for the biochar industry to expand. Um, Thanks so much. Oh, go, go ahead, Lauren, if, if you were still gone. Oh, no, I was just going to say more dollars to name it, the, the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities Program and similar programs like that, just to kind of close the loop as it relates to the farm bill. But yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Lauren. And David, I see your hand up if you want to jump in as well. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up briefly on the Climate Smart um, Agriculture Program. This So this was funded $20 billion under the Inflation Reduction Act. And this is supplemental funding. Uh, so it's discretionary money going to uh, USDA. Uh, and there is a, so with, all right, NRCS is able to fund fund projects through what are called um, practice standards. So I think it was mentioned earlier that we've got a uh, conservation practice standard 336, which al will allow NRCS to pay uh, farmers for putting biochar and compost and other organic amendments on their fields, pay partial, partially pay for costs. Okay. Um, the Climate Smart Ag projects uh, work the same way. They work through NRCS, and that money can be used uh, for supporting climate smart practices. And there is a list of approved climate smart ag practices, and unfortunately, 336 is not currently on that list. So I would say one priority in getting the Farm Bill would be to get 336 on that list. And a second priority then uh, is actually to raise the funding ability of the climate smart practices. Currently, um, a farmer can only receive about 10% of the money for a plot for a, a climate smart practice that they would get through the equip program. And so that's an in uh, another area that can be changed that would be very beneficial to um, biochar community. Great, great. Thank you so much, David, for for those additions. Appreciate that. And Amy, I want to come back to you as to see, based on what David's been saying, Lauren's been saying, if there's anything else that you want to expand on here. Um, and and as you do expand on responding directly to this, 
Also, would ask as, as part of your response to just as we start looking ahead, um, what else is on your radar over the next few months as it relates to, to policy? We've been talking a lot about the Farm Bill. I think it, it, and the focus of our webinar it showcases the significance of this moment. Um, but just anything else that you might be looking at, other trends, themes, policies that are moving on on the um, carbon removal, biochar, and and policy front. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll we'll let you you know first cover and, and respond to some of what's being said so far. Thank you, and I'll be really brief. Um, I just wanted, so David, I I, I can't wait to share our um, uh, biochar coalition comments with you because th that is literally like put biochar into every conservation practice, um, expand the funding for it, um, but being mindful of not uh, expanding it too far so that um, carbon removal credits are still available, um, and you know maintaining that and additionality factor um, financially. So um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that um, our approach is, is, yes, touching on agriculture, but it is working biochar into the mandatory funding parts of, of the bill, um, the crop insurance, the, um, uh, the nutrition. Um, there could be studies on how much biochar increases the nutrition of vegetables grown, which is a major climate issue uh, facing us. But getting into the crop insurance programs, getting soil health declared as a disaster monitor, that is mandatory funding. That is getting biochar into markets. It may not be the agricultural market, but agriculture accessing that is, that's going to be a learning and trust process, and it's going to be a longer path to ad um, adoption. Having USDA start to deploy agriculture in other ways into soils that demonstrate benefit carries a lot of water on that public adoption gap. Um, and so it's it's sometimes you come at things from the side in order to get directly where you're going. Um, and so that is one of the angles that we're taking um, on the farm bill is kind of putting in biochar um, where you, you might not expect to put it. Um, in terms of policies and trends coming up, um, uh, I, I think I, I might have um, a, a different view on things than, than others in terms of policy. I, um, I think you need to always be um, uh, working on it. You need to always be um, um, kind of uh, setting the table or tending your garden, if you will. Um, and I can see uh, tax incentives. I would love to see that for biochar. That would be something that um, we would want to work on. Um, getting Breaking down silos between EPA, uh, USDA, and DOE on biochar, because the electrical conductivity of biochar um, is, is significant. And there is a real need to move from high fossil fuel carbon intensive um, uh, ZEV or uh, electric um, transition uh, equipment, um, batteries, solar panels, all of that, um, to materials that include bio-based recyclable carbons. Um, and so there's a there's an angle for biochar there to be sure. Um, but I think that um, particularly in the US, there's a real role for private industry to play. And I am just delighted that um, Climate risk, I shouldn't say I'm delighted about climate risk, but um, the fact that the econo economic market, banking systems, large corporations are waking up to the fact that they have significant climate risk exposure um, through their value chains, that they have significant biodiversity exposure, that that exposure um, uh, jeopardizes their ability to continue to be in business. Um, I think that is starting to make corporations make voluntary changes. And um, just as Lauren was talking about the scope one through three, I'm always talking about that, about um, every, anyone who's in a value chain needs to reduce their scope one through three because you're somebody else's scope three problem. Don't be someone else's scope three problem. And biochar, um, along with the energy produced, can, can really help you do that. Um, so I'm looking at, at um, how investors are adopting ESG, um, and, and I think having conversations um, at those levels will be very important, and those can be written into ESG programs. Um, the folks like General Mills who are paying farmers to adopt climate smart practices, biochar is not in that. You know, we need to start having those those cross industry conversations. So I'm I'm very focused on breaking down silos between biochar industry, 
and industries that it could actually benefit and then need it significantly, because it is one of the most powerful carbon removal tools in existence. Um, When you look at what we would be able to draw down, like 35 um, uh, gigatons a year by 2050, if we scale, there's no, there's no other technology that could touch that. So. Thanks so much, Amy. I I think really helpful overview covering ESG and some of the different areas that you were of some of the different themes developments coming up that directly end up intersecting with biochar carbon removal. Want to turn it over to Sebastian to cover an additional theme that we're hearing a lot about today, tomorrow. I anticipate we'll continue to be hearing more and more about in the months ahead, which is measurement, reporting, and verification, which is both something that the industry is facing right now, thinking through, and it's something that I I think will surface in policy. And so, Sebastian, if you can expand on this a little bit and just tell us how the biochar industry is working to ensure high-quality biochar with long-lasting permanence would would be great to hear from you on that. Yeah, happy to. I mean, MRV is at the heart of being able to scale this industry without trust in uh, the robustness of the carbon removal. Uh, it won't really go anywhere in the voluntary market and definitely not in a future potential compliance market, um, especially in Europe. Uh, so I think one big advantage that biological carbon removal has, it already out of the industrial carbon removals, it has the most advanced standards in place, right? We already have several standards in place, uh, you know, among others, the, the EBC standard, the Pure standard, the Vera standard. Um, and this is a this is great that we already have them. And they share a lot of things, you know, they do in terms of life cycle assessments, they have a lot of commonalities, they differ in terms of, you know, permanence, tracking of application location and additionality. But um, we have these standards, and they all include MRV, and they create trust. Um, what I would stress as well is, for example, at Carbon Future, the company that I work with, <laughs> we actually integrate these standards into kind of an end-to-end tool that suppliers of biochar, producers of biochar, can use to very easily, much more easily and quickly prove their, their MRV. And that's another thing that I think is really important, that we need the standards, and then we need to create it, package it in a way that uh, the access to entry and to conducting this MRV is very low. And... Um, One interesting aspect about the market is that more and more producers are moving to certification. So in Europe, for example, in 2018, you had 50% of biochar being certified. Last year was already 70%, and that trend is growing, which essentially means that more and more production is going through this certification standardization process, uh, which is great news, because again, that will help with the offtake and with the market development. Maybe one note on permanence. Um, Permanence is an important factor uh, in MRV, um, and permanence for biochar is not as straightforward as one might think, right? Uh, On the one hand, which is amazing to see, biochar is dominating uh, research studies in the state of CDR report. I read that, you know, 40% of uh, the 28,000 scientific publications to date were on biochar. That's huge, you know, and it's growing. So there's a lot of effort going into that. And permanence has come at it from two different angles, from one angle predominantly historically, which was really focused on um, essentially agronomist soil scientists looking at the the biochar in the soil and how long it would last in the soil, which was anything from, you know, decades to hundreds of years to potentially longer. More recently, and this is something I want to highlight, we're seeing actually uh, geochemists, so people who study holes from a chemical perspective, coming into the biochar field. And this is really fascinating because they're essentially looking at the chemical composition of carbon, irrespectively of you know, what happens with irrigation. They're just looking at what's the chemical composition. And they are looking at what's basically called inertinite, which is one of the most stable structures in existence on the planet. Uh, and luckily, biochar has quite a lot of it. Um, you know, the numbers vary, some say 75%, 80, the latest study that was published uh, two weeks ago said up to 97% or even more. And this is highly, highly stable forms of carbon. So all to say that it's fascinating that a new field of study is coming into the biochar field. We're going to see, I think, a lot of debate. Um, and actually, if you want to get involved with that debate, there's also the European Biochar Summit is happening in Helsingborg. So quick plug in June, if you happen to be in Europe or want to come, we're definitely going to have those debates, probably even on stage between the different scientists. Um, but yeah, it, there's some, been some very interesting and promising developments. 
Thank you so much, Sebastian. I think really helpful to hear about that state of MRV and, and where it's going and, and a good opportunity for folks to be able to engage further in it in, in June. Just as we're continuing, I think, through the, the emerging trends and what's moving on the farm bill, but also what's moving in biochar carbon removal, because ultimately, I think the different points being made about how David was covering some um, parallel legislation that's moving to be combined and Amy was covering some, some different themes in climate and sustainability that can be combined. One other theme and, and topic that comes up in carbon removal and, and biochar that I wanted to ask you about, Lauren, is just as we're thinking about the deployment of biochar, if you can share thoughts you have about how to ensure that the growth of the biochar industry happens responsibly and in a way that can maximize local benefits. Yeah, that, that topic is really important to us. Um, just to name a couple topic areas on that note, um, I guess one, we are building large scale facilities. So, you know, as we as we think about those locations, you know, the the kind of core decision making criteria is sustainable feedstock supply. Is there enough waste biomass, either crop or timber residues in, um, that we can bring to our facility. Um, so that's, you know, number one, um, is this a facility that the community wants? Um, we will be producing renewable baseload electricity. Um, you know, is there markets within large ag that would, um, you know, that would take in that biochar? You know, number one for us is is engaging with community stakeholders, whether that's regional tribal nations, whether that's community groups, economic development um, councils to to explore. Um, you know, whether this is this is a facility, this is this is something that the community wants. And then, you know, I will say too, what is the end end result of that biochar? Obviously, we we want to retain those carbon removal credits, um, but exploring, you know, where that biochar um, is used is also important to us. So I think there the industry needs to grow really rapidly. I think, you know, we need to expand and become much more large scale. Um, and I think we can do that when, um, when we, you know, take in all of those considerations. I do have to note too, um, you know, we, we will be following um, uh, carbon removal protocols to sell our carbon removal credits. And there is um, pretty lengthy, um, protocols and regulations around, you know, where does your biochar come from? What to do with the biochar that really supports, um, I think, a healthy growth model for the industry as a whole. Um, I'm probably missing a whole lot there, but that's just to name a few. Great, great. Really good points there. And I, I think just on the importance of responsible deployment, MRV, the significance of the farm bill, all of the different topics we've been covering. Uh, just want to try and have all of you start bringing it together into any closing remarks you have. Um, key points that you want to highlight again, um, things that you may have not mentioned uh, yet. We'll ask you to be brief on the closing remarks because we'll then turn over to Q&A. And when we do that, I'll, I'll um, remind folks who are attendees how we'll do that and, and the best way to ask your questions and make sure that we hopefully get them answered. Um, so just as we're turning over to closing remarks, Amy, we'll want to begin with you. And I know just as Lauren was talking about responsible deployment, fresh on our minds about how to ensure that the um, carbon removal industry and the biochar industry within that scales up responsibly. And so we'll turn it over to you to expand on anything you want to share there, as well as just any ways you want to bring it all together. Sure. Thank you. And I'll be, I'll be really brief. Um, so I am a, a co-founder and president of Facet Power, and we are developing um, bioenergy systems that are designed to be complete climate solution energy ecosystems in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we are um, implementing a program with a very, very large um, uh, an international NGO. And as part of that process, it was a two-year negotiation, um, we needed to go through a very extensive um, uh, not only diligence process, but also process of putting together um, uh, methods and principles and policies for responsible deployment. Um, and there is a lot to be learned for any project developer from some of those international principles. And I would say starting with an account accountability framework um, is, is, is one place that industry can start. Um, and 
one of the things that we've done in the um, American Biogas Council was to recognize that w w the industry suffers if one person um, has a has a massive failure. So adopting standards for um, uh, and protocols for the way that you develop um, was of critical importance to us. And, and we went ahead and did that. We spent four years working with folks to do that. Um, and so I think the biochar industry would benefit from um, a coalition effort to put one of those in place. And it's really about putting together a um, sustainability framework and being accountable to it and recognizing um, basic principles in um, human rights and uh, fair labor environment, do no harm, no deforestation, all of those things, um, I think, lead to um, responsible deployment. And even in the US, we should be looking at how our access of uh, feedstocks impacts local livelihoods. Um, so I, I, would, I would love to see the industry think about that in terms of responsible deployment. Thank you so much, Amy. I, re really great points on, on responsible deployment and appreciate you building on what Lauren said. Um, just as we continue with closing thoughts from panelists before we go to question, Sebastian, we'll turn it over to you next for anything else that you might wanna add in. Yeah, first, um, I think I wanna stress the importance of connecting Europe and the US in this discussion. I think there's a lot we can learn from each other um, and respective strengths that we can leverage. Um, so that's just one thing that I, I encourage everyone to do. Um, and especially in Europe, one thing maybe to follow is uh, the carbon removal certification framework, uh, which is kind of the first real attempt to define what high quality carbon removal is at the policy level. And uh, people like myself are working hard to make sure that uh, biogen carbon removal um, is, yeah, is appreciated for the potential it has. And I think that could have a huge impact beyond Europe, also on the US. So uh, yeah, just creating those linkages, I think will be really, really valuable moving forward. Thanks so much. Great point, Sebastian. Uh, David, any closing remarks from your end? Uh, sure, there's just two points that I'd like to make. First on this uh, responsible deployment area, I'm, I'm a soil scientist. And um, one of the key things in my mind is, it, you know, if you look at the billion ton study, a large part of that is from crop residue and the sustainable harvesting of crop residue is absolutely vital. If we take too much residue, we expose the soil to erosion, we can lose soil organic carbon. One thing that needs to be emphasized is that biochar has the opportunity of building that soil carbon and actually making the harvesting of crop residues sustainable. Obviously you need enough uh, residue left on the surface and conservation practices to protect erosion, but the soil carbon side of residue harvesting is solved. So this kind of knowledge needs to be put in. The second point I wanted to make, uh, and, and I think this is really important, it, it took a massive industry of fossil fuels to get us in this climate change problem that we're in right now. And it's going to take large scale industry to dig us out. Um, and if we look currently at the energy portfolio, some 30% of the oil is still used for diesel and jet. Even if we electrify all the gasoline, we're going to be very challenged to replace that diesel and jet fuels uh, for our economy. And emerging technology through uh, fast pyrolysis will allow us to produce those fuels that can be used to displace petroleum in the very hard to decarbonize sectors. And that's an opportunity then to scale uh, biochar systems, hopefully sustainably. Thank you so much, David, great point. Lauren, closing comments, remarks from you? Yeah, I think quickly to just note is that we, Mino views the biochar industry as everything we're doing kind of floats all boats. We need all of these actions that we mentioned at scale, billions of dollars of investment to really have the impact that we wanna have 
on mitigating the climate crisis. And so I think um, just to note the scale, I think, you know, biochar industry is here and we need to be here in the next decade. Um, and so I think all hands on deck. I know a lot of you in the chat are saying how to get involved. Um, and so I think, you know, continued engagement um, innovation and number one, expanding the markets for biochar so that we can have an industry that that we need to have the to have the impact. So, thanks. Thanks so much, Lauren. Great point. Appreciate all of the terrific remarks from our panelists. I, I think it it covers the the technicality, the nuance, and the depth and the opportunities that we have to get into in the farm bill. And so I think those specific examples show how many opportunities and how extensive and how many different elements of biochar it touches on, as well as some of the different themes and trends coming down the, down the pike that um, will likely end up having direct intersections with the farm bill at one point or another. The topics like responsible deployment, measurement, reporting, and verification, and, and some of uh, all of that, the other great remarks that you shared. Want to transition now over to Q&A in our final 15 minutes here to try and get to as many questions as possible from the audience. Um, two different ways to ask questions. Several of you have actively been through the webinar and it's terrific and we appreciate adding your questions into the, the Q&A function. Um, if you haven't dropped in a question yet, please feel free to do so. We will work to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, some of your questions might be answered directly uh, by, by, uh, by Wendy or Bella that we have on the line, and some of them will ask out loud to the panelists. Uh, another option that you've got is to raise your hand, and in a time-permitting world, we'll, we'll try and let you off mute and, and get to you. Um, so please, if you haven't thought of your questions yet and drop them in, do it. We will work to get to as many as possible in our remaining time here. And just as we transition in the Q&A, I want to call out one particular question that uh, had had um, that that had surfaced from a, a couple of folks, um, which is the the significance of the farm bill for the global market. Um, the the farm bill is focused um, on on U.S. funding, but just as we think through the implications of the farm bill internationally. Um, Sebastian and David, want to see if you both in particular have any thoughts on this question, and, and Sebastian will go to you first, um, David, you next, and then we'll, we'll try and jump to the next question unless Amy or Lauren, there's anything that, that you've got on this one, and if not, we'll put you both on deck for the next question. The way that I see it is the farm bill could be for biotech carbon removal what the IRA is for direct air capture, right? It could be this massive boost to the sector. And uh, that would create a rising tide that lifts all boats, not just in the US. Um, so thinking in that way, um, it cr could create a very strong market signal. It could create uh, a scaling of you know, the equipment, of you know, driving of innovation. And all of that would obviously have a huge impact on uh, biochar production also outside the US. And what we also see with the IRA, we see that other regions like Europe have to catch up and are thinking of their own. I mean, we saw Norway setting up a very similar tax credit to 45Q, right? So um, I could imagine that that could happen as well. So um, yeah, that's that's how I think about it, is uh, if it were to become that powerful a vehicle to drive BCR in the US, it would certainly have those uh, synergies and spill over to, to Europe and other regions as well. Thanks, Sebastian, great point. Uh, appreciate that. David, anything else you wanna add into that for the international significance of the farm bill? Uh... No, I think Spashin's covered it well. All, all, you know, the, the, the concept of rising tide, lifting all boats is important. The U.S. Farm Bill is going to be money spent in the U.S. and on U.S. programs. But the research is global. The growth in the industry and the markets are global. And, and the technology development has global implications. Thanks, David. Great, great points. Um, Want to jump over to another question again, trying to get to as many as we can. Um, Lauren, we'll go to you first on this, and then Amy, if you've got anything to add. Uh, folks ask you about how are there resources for small companies and entrepreneurs just to navigate all these different opportunities and, and how people can gain access into funding. And I think some of that funding, because the Farm Bill is actively moving, um, I take that question and maybe mean some existing funding that's already been approved and allocated by Congress as maybe as well as upcoming funding when, when the Farm Bill is eventually finalized. Um, and so just for small businesses, entrepreneurs navigating this process, Lauren, um, over to you first, and then Amy, if you've got anything else to add on to Lauren's remarks. 
Yeah, I think maybe just to note a couple areas, I think for super small businesses and even startups like ours, I think non-dilutive capital and kind of federal and state funding to support whether technology development or product development are essential. Obviously, USDA and DOE have SBIR programs, small business innovation research programs, and we're seeing also grants within U.S. Forest Service and USDA to you know, support um, biochar industry. I'll also note resources such as um, the U.S. Biochar Coalition, new, but IBI and USBI as sort of the, the central hubs for, for understanding what resources are out there. Um, so that's, that's just one note. And the one, I wanted to add one comment around IRA is I think, you know, I think in a lot of ways the IRA does support the biochar industry tangentially. I think if we had had a stronger voice then when the IRA was developed, I think we would see biochar and the asset that we're now making in the farm bill a bit more amplified. You know, having, I joined Mino, I guess, uh, to, into early 2022 um, and seeing, you know, running through IRA and not seeing, maybe biochar was named once for a small scale um, demonstration project is not what we wanna be seeing in one of the largest foundational climate um, uh, bills passed. And so I think having a stronger voice um, federally together and seeing biochar show up in the farm bill is kind of our, is our first shot at really expanding the industry. And I think any, any future climate bill that passed, we need to make sure biochar has a stronger voice in it to expand markets. Excellent. Thank you, Lauren. Amy, anything else that you want to expand on related to that question? Um Sure. Um, but uh, I just, before that, I want, just wanted to say for internationally, um, you know, USDA and DOE do have programs that um, support agriculture and energy and bioenergy internationally. And so the Farm Bill, um, if we can uh, tap into biochar's um, impact on nutrition um, and increasing the nutritional uh, content of plants, um, or saw, like the climate resilience and some of the disaster programs, that is more um, uh, ammunition for DOE, I mean, uh, USDA in some of their, um, their grant programs um, and working overseas to actually require that or specify it. That's another big thing of working with the federal government is you, one of the things we will work on is getting uh, biochar specified into grants or uh, specific contracting provisions. I mean, there are ways to get things worked in. So I do see um, the, uh, the, I do see possibilities for international implications that would increase adoption, not immediately, but over time. Um, and then uh, just to what, to what uh, Lauren said, I mean, I think um, when I went to the U.S. Bi the biochar conference, which was incredible um, uh, in West Virginia, put on um, by USBI and IVI, um, it, it was really interesting to me that almost no one knew about the tax credit for gasifiers um, it, that has been in existence um, for, for a long time. Um, and that's the kind of information that you can only access if you have uh, experienced um, uh, federal policy folks, government um, folks who are tracking and um, all of the different um, uh, incentives that are available to you and funding mechanisms. Um, and so the, the U.S. Biochar Coalition, one of the things that we do we are going to do is set up a, every two weeks as a member, you will be on the line with the lobbyists and getting an update on where different incentives are going or headed. Um, and, and so you will be up to date on, on those things. Um, and, uh, and I really do think that there needs to be a, um, an access point for that kind of information. For folks who are starting out, um, there is a, a lot of funding um, in rural communities for rural energy programs. Um, with REAP, you can get um, a significant grant for starting um, a bioenergy facility that would have biochar um, uh, if you're in a rural area. There are underserved community grants um, starting out by going to your farm service um, agency office and saying, what codes or conservation practices 
or um, subsidized loans can you help me get because I want to do this? Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And I think with having um, an industry association and lobbying presence, we can distill that down into action steps for people. Um, the way that things are set up right now, um, if you are not, um, don't have a real agility around the different programs, um, it's hard to access. It is. So I think the industry is really time for us to come together and put something together that helps um, uh, sort of um, streamline uh, the effort to get more systems out there and more folks into the industry. Thanks so much, Amy. Excellent point. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, one question, and I think we're going to make this our, our final question, just running tight on, on the clock here, is some, uh, a couple of folks asked a question about the, the ongoing conversations in biochar and the question of, of permanence. And so there, this question emerges about if biochar can ever be included in the permanent carbon removal category. Um, Sebastian, you were touching on some of this with MRV during your remarks. And so we'll, we'll go over to you for, for addressing that question. Yeah, and maybe first, there are, I've seen two ways to describe define permanence, right? There's kind of one which is leading, I would say, especially in the US in uh, folks like Frontier and so on, which is kind of the thousand year threshold, right? And uh, in Europe, actually, we see permanence very clearly defined in legislative framework as several centuries, not thousand, but several centuries, plus uh, liability schemes in place for what happens when something goes wrong. Um, I would say on the durability first, um, as I said earlier, um, depending on which perspective you take, you might land below or above these thresholds. So what I'm really going to see here, what I'm excited about is uh, much more input in the future from uh, geochemists coming into the space to see, uh, because that that's really where potentially the permanence for biochar could, could land. Um, if it's just based on uh, the soil science, I doubt that we will really cross the thousand year timeline, right? So this is something that we'll, we'll have to see how the discussion unfolds, but I'm rather optimistic. And um, the second aspect, the liability frameworks, this is where biochar, at least as far as I can tell, um, is not as advanced as a lot of the CCS-based methods, right? So I think a lot of work will have to be done um, to make sure that we account for potentially what happens if things go wrong. But again, if we know that it's stable carbon that won't change, which is the, what the geochemists are saying, uh, then that would also be taken care of in one go. So I think a lot of it rests on uh, future scientific inputs, um, but as of today, it would probably be a top sell. Great, thank you for that, Sebastian. Appreciate those those remarks, and thank you so much to our audience for calling in and staying with us for the last hour and a half during the webinar and and hearing this information. Uh, I want to give a, a major thank you to our panelists for just sharing your expertise and insights about the significance of the Farm Bill, why it matters for biochar in the U.S., why it matters for biochar globally, and then want to give a, a thank you as well to the the co-organizers of this event, the U.S. Biochar Coalition and the International Biochar Initiative. And uh, we, like we mentioned at the beginning, the webinar will be recorded. We'll share around a recording. Uh, additional resources on this coming soon, including that that uh, policy brief we mentioned on the Farm Bill that will be released on May 2nd. And so stay tuned. There's a lot coming down the, the pike. Uh, this is going to be a fast moving space as conversations continue to ramp up on the Farm Bill. And just want to thank everybody again. Terrific remarks. Appreciate it. So thank you again to the panelists and for all the attendees. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you very much.